we bow our heads. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity to be here to share your message, Lord. I pray that that is, in fact, what will come from my lips. And I thank you, Lord, for the fact that we are part of a global church and that we can operate as a family to reach those that need us the most and to reach out far beyond our family. Lord, you are coming soon, and we hope to be part of making that happen. We look forward to being in your service until the day you come and then worshiping you forevermore. I pray this in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, can you all hear me okay in the back? No? All right. I'm going to get a little louder here, a little closer. All right. So are we good? Great. Okay, so thank you for choosing to come to the relevant health message for our global church. There's a lot to share. But I want to start out with a few questions. First, you know I like questions from my 30-second intro. Uh, why is it that during the next hour that we're going to be in this room together, there's going to be 14 Americans that drop dead simply because of the food that they eat? And why is there a 20-year gap of life expectancy between affluent suburbs of most American cities and their inner city neighbors? And why is it that the entire continent of Africa does not have a single blue zone? Those are the types of questions that I've been asking for a long time. I've been passionate about public health nutrition for about 30 years, studied about Adventists when I was in my undergrad program. I'd never met one, but I actually was doing my papers on vegetarianism because I'd been a vegetarian since I was nine through my own convictions, and you can read my testimony as you grow out or if you grab it. Um, the Lord has been leading me and guiding me into this church, but I was only baptized a few years ago and only met my first Adventists about six years before that. So I praise God for being part of this church. It's so exciting because I feel like these questions I've been wrestling with for 30 years, I now have this whole group of people that like to actually wonder about the same things and not just think about it and not just pray about it, but actually do something about it. And that's what I am really excited to be a part of. Now, all of you answered the first question right, I think, yesterday. And that is, do we truly believe that Jesus came that we might all, all people, have life abundantly? And that's, in fact, what he says. In John 10.10, 10, we know that the great controversy is in that very verse. Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but he comes that we might have life and have it abundantly. We know that we're not the only ones talking about abundant life. There's other people in the Christian community speaking about abundant life. All over Africa, you have pastors and preachers selling different ways that people can get abundant life. And a lot of it is kind of trickery. For example, this pastor is sharing that he knows that the principles of abundant life work because they work so well for he and his wife that they have a $10.5 million mansion. That's not the type of abundant life we are sharing about. That's not the promise that you want, that, that I'm offering here or that the Bible offers. So we're getting a little closer to the promise of abundant life that Jesus is talking about when we look at the blue zones. And if you notice, there's five of them. I hope you're all aware of them. We have one in North America, and it's those good old Loma Linda Seventh-day Adventists, right? Something really special is going on in our church that is causing us to have an abundant life. And we can use this information as an entering wedge, as the right arm of the gospel to open doors to conversations about something very unique that's going on. Something so unique that National Geographic, a, a magazine that's really committed to its secular evolutionary focus, is going to highlight a bunch of Christians. It's pretty exciting. But you'll take note, I, I was able to put that magazine on, on one place in the con on the globe. It's covering a continent. What continent is it? Africa. I didn't need to show Africa. There's not a blue zone there. That's my hope with Farm Stew. And even in your community or in your home, that we would have the ability to have a blue zone in your family, in your community, surrounding your church because of the outreach that you're doing. And then that through our partnership with the global family of faith, that we would have hotspots of health and longevity all over the continent of Africa and other parts of the world 
where our ministries are working. So we know not all Adventists are doing the right things. Not all of us are benefiting from the health message. We have what's defined as the best behaved Adventists contrasted by the worst behaved Adventists here. And there's a full 10 years difference of life expectancy between the men and, and 8.7 years difference in the women. So we know that just because you're sitting in a pew does not mean that you're going to get the benefits of the Adventist health message. Am I right? <laughs> Sometimes my kids, who I'm still the only Adventist in my family, and I'm, I'm sad to say that my kids, because I raised them vegetarian, they had never had a hot dog until they came to an Adventist function, <laughs> which is pretty sad because then when they go to other functions, they sometimes eat hot dogs, even though there's things in them I really would beg them not to eat. It, that, that's kind of a hard thing for me. But they also ask me, Mom, if you guys have this wonderful health message, if you're running around the country telling everybody about your health message, why, why are so many people in your church so unhealthy? And I don't have a good answer for that. And I'm not trying to judge or throw anybody under the bus, but it hinders our witness, even in my own family. And that does hurt me. Because we know better. We are taught better. So let's look a little bit into these blue zones. What is going on in these blue zones that are causing abundant life? So I love a little Venn diagram like this. So we have three concentric circles with three of the five blue zones. We have Loma Linda up top, Sardinia, Italy, and Okinawa, Japan. And the characteristics that they all, three of them share, are highlighted in red. So we have the uh, strong families. We know there's a lot, and just as I'm reading these characteristics, think about what you know of Ellen White's writings. Think of what you know about the Bible, and think about also what you can observe in nature or how these things are connected to nature, because that's our sources for inspiration. Strong families, no smoking. We also have uh, no alcohol. So there's our temperance message right there. We have the plant-based diet highlighted by high soy, fava beans over there, turmeric, <laughs> different things that are coming from plants. Where are they getting those plants? They're gardening. Most of these cultures are gardening. And then they have constant activity. So these are not people necessarily with a gym membership that go four times a week and walk on a treadmill. These are people who are incorporating movement into their regular daily lives and having sometimes occupations that require movement. Then. One of my favorites, and you'll see by the end of the session, legumes, legumes, legumes. Beans, they are very, very powerful. And these cultures are eating them in four times the quantity that we typical Americans are. So a couple other things to highlight. Um, they're eating whole grains. We'll talk a bit more about that. They have, they're culturally isolated. Now in our, in our thinking, in our, in our sort of politically correct, that might seem like, culturally isolated, like we're off to ourselves, that's not good. But when God calls us to be consecrated or a peculiar people, having some isolation from this culture is a good thing, right? <laughs> and then I like the one, strong women, okay? So one of the things that we are trying to do in Africa too, we are trying to build up the entire family. And really you'll see focusing on the men and the women, but doing it in a partnership and not in a um, domineering type situation. So that's just a quick rundown. We know that the people from Loma Linda follow a particular prescription for abundant life. New start, you're familiar with it. Nutrition, exercise, water, sunshine, temperance, air, rest, and trust in God. This is a fabulous, powerful <laughs> recipe for abundant life, and I want to take nothing from it. In fact, I have my master's in public health from Johns Hopkins University, paid a lot of money for that degree 20 years ago. And when I heard about New Start, I thought, wow, that is worth the entire thing. That is the most powerful thing I've heard of because people can actually remember it. There are simple changes that people can apply to their lives and they're fantastic. But my question is, how are these women going to receive the blessing of this health message if they've just walked a mile to get water and they have to do that every day or maybe even a few times a day. And you go up to them and you say, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. You need to get more exercise. How about some fresh air? Sunshine? You're lacking that. I don't think so, right? 
So we need a health message that is for them and will be applying to them. How about these guys? Oops. Uh, these guys, you know, we're telling them you need to feed your family a plant-based diet and, you know, really provide for their needs. But out in these rural communities, there's no jobs. How are they going to provide for their needs if there's no jobs? In Zimbabwe, for example, to buy fresh fruits and vegetables five a day, it would cost 52% of their income just to eat that. Who's going to be able to do that? I actually spoke to a room of 200 Adventist Zimbabweans a couple weeks ago at their camp meeting here in Chicago, and they all acknowledged that's true. It's, things are so expensive there. If they can't grow it themselves, they're not going to be feeding it to their children. And you know, here in America, that, we have the same problem. There, the fresh fruits and vegetables are kind of expensive for a lot of people. And my job before starting Farm Stew was actually working at our local health department, working with local farmers and promoting farmers markets and promoting the consumption of the food that they grew and encouraging people to grow. And I mean, the data in just my little rural Illinois county of the number of people eating enough fresh, fresh fruits and vegetables, it was only 12% of the people in my rural county that were eating what they were supposed to be eating. And we know the consequences of that in diabetes, cancers, obesity, all of the ramifications. They're scary. So gardening here is a powerful thing. For these women, if we're telling them that they need to drink more water, but yet that water is full of parasites that would make their children ill, we're not doing them any great favor, right? So it's wonderful. ASI is so inspiring. As you walk through that exhibit hall, and I encourage you to do that, there's all sorts of ministries here that are addressing these basic issues. We are one of a whole crowd of ministries addressing these basic issues. But one of the things that Farmster is doing that's different, and I hope can be applied here in the United States too, is really trying to take the counsel of Alan White and international development research throughout the last few decades, which honestly, she should be at the top of the list for any international development class ever given. She says amazing things. One of them is, we may give to the poor and harm them by teaching them to be dependent. That's something that we have done far too often in our country and around the world. She says, you may give to the poor and injure them because you teach them to be dependent. Instead, teach them to support themselves. This will be true help. The needy must be placed in positions where they can help themselves. What I love about what she says there is not to just have them help themselves. She says the needy must be placed in a position that does involve help from the outside. She's not negating the power of having help from the outside, but it's a particular type of help that doesn't hurt. So I had the privilege in 2015 to go with a USAID sponsored farmer to farmer program. It was like a miniature Peace Corps. And I got to go to Uganda and my assignment by the federal government, believe it or not, was to teach local people through farmers cooperatives to work with soy. And I was very excited about that because I wanted to learn more about soy. And I knew that the children there were extremely malnutrition, malnourished with protein deficiency. And I knew that soy protein was incredibly powerful. In fact, it's the only bean that has all nine essential amino acids needed for human health. The American Heart Association says it could be your only source of protein and you would be perfectly fine. So I know soy is a bit controversial sometimes. They use all non-GMO, lightly processed soy here. But when we were working on that, um, I was just there for three weeks and I felt that after about a week or so, the local Ugandans that I was working with, and I could take an hour and 15 minutes to tell you how God worked miracles there, but I won't. But God introduced me to people through the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I wasn't even baptized yet at that time, and you'll read about that in the testimony. But when I met the Adventists, I knew I had to just go ahead and cross the line and get baptized and join the church. I needed to be part of this church family. And they were working with me alongside just as volunteers in the training. And as, I, as the days progressed, I talked less. They talked more. Of course, they can do it in their local language. They know the culture. The people were just so animated and interactive. 
And I started praying about it every night when I went home. And, and God said, you know, you have to go home at the end of the three weeks. You have children you have to take care of. But there's children dying of malnutrition here. And you don't have to stop the training just because you have to go home. You can hire these people and they can continue on the work. And it was such a strange revelation that I had to have it be confirmed. On my last day there, I was at an Adventist church. They'd given me the pulpit. They'd given me all afternoon to teach in the seminar, uh, teach a seminar. And there was a young woman, Fiona, that came up to me and she said, I want to be part of your team. She had no idea God had already told me to start a team. So those five people that we first hired are still with us today, leading this ministry called Farm Stew. And so I want to share some of the ideas of what is working in Africa. And then I want to spend some time for some discussion for us to think about how might that work in our local context as well. So the message shared in Africa, we start with people. I was telling you about these hand-picked people, and I want to introduce you to Betty. She's one of our lead trainers, and she'll introduce herself fabulously. At least I hope so. I'm Musuro Betty, uh, a staff in farms to Uganda. I'm really so grateful to see that I'm working the real work which I've been longing for, to go down to the ground, to tell people the right things to do. Farms too has changed my life. In fact, I have to say, me personally, before I go out, it first changed me in my diet, at least with something where I can buy things which I, I feel like. Because at the end of the day, I can support myself, I can support, uh, support my family. And what is amazing me, slowly by slowly, whenever we are going out, people are being changed. One lady called Aisha Tobola, she's staying in Jinja, Uganda, in the sub-county called Mafobira. That lady was uh, obesity. She had that problem. And whenever she could laugh, you could see the stomach <laughs> shaking. But when, when the first time when farms to came to, to teach, this lady implemented whatever they were training. Aisha now, she's a real slim, slender lady. She's a young girl who is waiting. At least now a man can look at her and say, wow. So for me, I'm so grateful. And why am I so grateful? I'm being communicated to all over the world. I could not know joy. How could I walk there? But then she came. Joy is contacting us to other people whom we, we can join hands and really make farms to so wonderful. Farms to Oye, farms to on the top. Thank you very much. I'm Musuro Betty. So you can see the joy that, that I have in this work. It's uh, such a blessing, honestly, um, because they, they exude the joy of the Lord. And Betty was a chorister at the church in Jinja. I'm Mrs. Tabile oh. Dube from oh Skobingo goodness, District. I'm here under Farm Street Department of Farming. This is, I'll just let her talk for just a second. This is a woman in Zimbabwe who has been trained and has gone through week, a lot of um, changes in terms it. of learning agriculture. We started making, our, uh, being introduced to Farm Street Department. That's a then compost pile. The second day we came here and met our... Okay, I'm going to pause it now. Okay. So you can see these trainers have so much enthusiasm and and their, their changes in their lives have been so powerful. So I just want to share with you one of the uh, stories from Zimbabwe. Uh, this is the Mutemas. They were trained in agriculture. And I truly believe agriculture is one of the best forms of evangelism, both here in this country and abroad. In my own garden, in my yard, it's the way that I interact with my neighbors and my neighbors' kids. You know, when you have raspberries coming out of 
you know, all over the place and you can let people come and enjoy raspberries and they come up year after year with almost no work. It's just a powerful witness to be able to share something that's such a blessing. The Mutemas did the same thing. They now are inviting all sorts of families to come and, and celebrate learning. And so when Farms 2 came to train them again, not only did their garden look like uh, the Eden itself, but they had about 30 or 40 of their neighbors, including a Pentecostal pastor, there for an all-day training and just sharing what they had learned. And it was just a powerful witness to their neighbors. Um, they continue to be very, very inspiring. And these are not our staff. These are people that our staff have trained and now are training others. So that's the power of this this particular work is the multiplier effect of training of trainers. So this is just one of the, the classes in the black, in the green is Hector Black I'm going to speed up just a bit so you can see Betty. Betty actually came to Zimbabwe with me to help launch the Zimbabwe team. Right. Now the ladies, they are doing that. We have a God of a plan, and we have a God with a plan. The nose is not on the ears. Mm -hmm. eh? the, the eyes are. Eh? Not on that. So she is saying God is a God of order. And and how important it is that we have order in our in our homes and in our work. So one of the things that we really focus on and I think is very important to focus on is this idea that if we are Seventh-day Adventists, we know about the Sabbath and resting on the Sabbath, but the commandment also says six days you labor and work. And that is a really, really important principle for all of us, but particularly at times in developing countries, we really want people to have a strong work ethic. That is one of the things that has built the West, was the Protestant work ethic, and it's something that we as Seventh-day Adventists could be champion for the whole world. I want to ask you guys a question. Any ideas what that is? Coconuts? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> okay, now you have to still guess. Okay, it says the answer. Jackfruit. So Ellen White talks about using local foods. She was probably the first promoter of the local foods movement, which is now very popular in our country. And there's a lot of energy behind this whole local foods for local people, pulling out some of her quotes, trying to figure out what you could use, supporting local farmers. It's all in line with our Adventist health message. And it's making a huge difference. This is in actually a prison in Jinja, Uganda. We, the church was doing a Bible study in this prison once a month. And they had a few people that were coming and, and a few women that were interested. Farm Stew started coming in, and we now have 306 Adventists in this prison. There is a revival going on in this prison, actually. Just in the last month, I've actually made a plea out to a few people. We're trying to get Bibles and hymnals for these people. It's so powerful. And the thing that's happening is that they have hope now that when they get out, they can provide for their families. And that is something that's so exciting because you know, one of the things we were talking about and, and the gentleman that spoke about having the house for people that get out of prisoners, I was asking him backstage, do you have a garden at this house? Because one of the very best means of um, helping people not go back into prison is actually having a garden. It's very, very powerful ministry, just the hopefulness of watching something grow. So we reviewed the, the recipe for Abundant Life has these ingredients. What if your church property looked like this? How attractive would that be? You know? Or maybe not in your church property if you live far from it, but you know, even at your own home, how inviting would that be for your neighbors and your friends? What kind of ministry, what kind of 
your health message might be much more well received if you're giving them not only just an idea about recipe, but you can actually give them the fruits and vegetables to make it possible. One of our things about attitude, we really talk about trusting in God and having an optimistic attitude, but some of us actually also have to change our attitude about gardening. Uh, this is Robert, one of our trainers, he's an agronomist, and Fatima in the middle, and David. David was a cobbler, shoemaker. Do you notice something about his feet? <laughs> they, I, I was like, why does he have not have shoes if he's a cobbler? But apparently they save their shoes. They don't take them to the garden because you wouldn't want to get mud on your shoes. So they garden barefoot. But Fatima was really kind of feeling depressed. She couldn't feed her kids. She couldn't send them to school. She was really struggling. And lo and behold, when we went and trained her and talked to her about how farming was the first God-given occupation, she later confessed to us that she had thought it was a curse. To put your hand in the soil is very undignified in a lot of people's minds. It's, it's something you, the kids get punished to go do. Go out and dig in the garden. It's for the lower class, almost. So when she realized that that was not true, and we could, we could use scripture, and we can use Ellen White to prove that that is not true. She says she had her turning point. She now feels to be a really contributing member of her community and her family. And the beautiful thing is she has a business. She's selling vegetables all around town. <laughs> and she's sending her kids to school and feeding her family as a result. Rest. We talk a lot about rest uh, and the importance of the nightly rest. We in America are actually running an experiment of sleep deprivation. We're sleeping two hours less than we did just a few decades ago, or a hundred years ago, less than a hundred years ago. And it's actually a frightening thing with frightening implications. Even people in developing countries are having a hard time getting their rest because of so many pressing factors that are different than ours, like having to wake up at four o'clock in the morning if you're a little girl and going and getting water so that you can be in time for school. But we also need rest for the soil. We need crop rotation. A lot of the challenges of Africa is that their crop productivity is 70 percent, I'm sorry, it's only one third of the productivity of the soil on other continents. And a lot of it is because of planting the same crop over and over again on the same soil. And the idea of crop rotation is so important. And mulching and covering it with compost and mulch. Meals, really focusing on those plant-based whole foods diet using mostly what the family can grow themselves. Now here's a question, how many of you have a garden? Wow, this is a great self-selected group. How many, keep your hands up real quick, how many of you try to live on only what you can grow in that garden? <laughs> right? None of us would make it. But of the world's poorest, hungriest people, of which there are 795 million, the vast, vast, vast majority of them, 98% are living in developing countries and 70% of them are in rural villages where the only job is farming. So if we can't live off of what we grow and you have no training in agriculture, how are you going to feed a family of 10 or 12 off of what you can grow? They really need some additional training. The sanitation work is so important, focusing on just that hand washing. We talked about that earlier about just hand washing and how that's the single most effective measure to prevent disease. And then our temperance message is, is really the same as what we teach here in terms of no addictive behavior and choices that um, would, would be, cause us to be uh, in a cycle of addiction, I'll just say. But we also talk about emotional temperance. And one of the things we're so excited about is the reduction in, um, in domestic violence where we've trained, there's less, less domestic violence. Enterprise, also teaching people jobs. So again, here in this country, there are more jobs here than are most places around the world, but still, people need to be thinking entrepreneurial and training their children entrepreneurially. This is Florence in the blue. She actually is a, a wife of an elder. The elder is sitting next to her in the pink, and one of our trainers is up in the yellow. She now makes soy milk, which is she's making on the bottom, and soy mandazi that she sells at the market. Again, being able to send her own kids to school. The water we know is so important. Our bodies are about 70% water, and a lot of people just really don't know the importance of drinking water. It's, it's critical. 
And finally, the most important ingredient in the recipe of abundant life is that we promote the water of life, Jesus Christ. So just to give you an idea of how we teach in the villages and some ideas that you could teach even in your own community, just come out this health message a slightly different way. So why do white people get sunburns? Whenever we go to Africa, <laughs> we get sunburns. Any ideas? Yes, the pigment in our skin. So we're lacking that dark, beautiful melanin that gives the protection. The dark African skin provides four times the protection than white skin does. And so there's something special about that color. And we want to make sure we encourage people to, to appreciate that protection. But what are most people eating? Foods that are white, foods that are highly processed, foods that have been um, losing their nutritional value because of taking off the aspects of it that would provide it color. But what is God's health plan? We see that the Lord planted a garden, and there he put humans. And out of the ground, the Lord made all kinds of trees to grow, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. So we really encourage people to eat foods that are pleasing to the eye. That doesn't sound like a thou shalt not, does it? <laughs> Eating foods that are pleasing to the eye is so important. And those dark colors, when, when you, uh, a food is white like that, like white flour, white rice, even a white potato, um, it means that that outer shell of the seed has been taken out or the skin of the seed has been taken off. Also, the germ has been taken off. So when we eat all three parts of the seed, can you think of something else that's a three in one? Yeah, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So here we are talking to 80% Muslims in Eastern Uganda, and we're telling them that the only type of food that's going to give you life is the three in one reflection of the one true God. That's kind of a fun form of evangelism. <laughs> we also, they know it because they're farmers. You can't put a seed in the ground that's missing one of those parts and expect it to grow, can you? So why would you think it would make your body come to life? So what happens when you remove the skin of a potato or of a seed or what? Anybody know? You're losing a lot of nutrient value, right? The skin of the potato contains significant nutrients. The five grams of fiber, 88% of the iron, 40% of the potassium and calcium, and then so much more. There is so many nutrients that we lose in the skin. And this is, this is the pile of skin right there. What usually happens with that in, in homes or out in rural villages? You throw it out? Okay, if you're in a rural village in Africa, what do you think happens to it? It, here we go, guys. <laughs> the chickens are smart, right? The animals will eat it. Even in our big industrialized food system, when all these parts of the seed are taken off, they all become animal feed. Why? Anybody know? It's where the bulk of the nutrition is. And so, guess what? You make money off of growing healthy animals. The sad thing is, you make money off of sick people. <laughs> so when you are destroying God's three-in-one picture of himself and eating highly processed foods, you're playing into the system that's all about making money at the end of the day. It's really, really tragic. But God is very clear. He says in Genesis 1.29, which I like to call God's dietary guidelines, he says, see, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. So the seed, it's very, very important to God. And I want to encourage people to think about it. So back to the blue zones for a bit, because I still believe we can keep talking about this and keep talking about this. We see some of the things that the people are doing. They're moving naturally they, from the right tribe. They have the right outlook, and they're eating wisely. So we can look at what are the diets of these Blue Zone people. Most of them are eating a plant-based diet. They're not all vegans. They're not all vegetarians. But the things that are the superfoods identified are all plant-based. And you can see I highlighted the beans. Beans, beans, beans. Black beans, beans, and soy milk. 
there's a plant slant, they call it, in all of these diets. One thing that I like to share is this is adapted from the University of Michigan. Uh, it's the Healing Food Guide Pyramid. I love it because it starts with the basis of water. I've never seen a, another food guide that starts with that basis. As you go up, you get the layer of fruits and vegetables, the whole grains like we've talked about, and now we know that's the three-in-one seed, the legumes, the seasonings, and healthy fats. And then I altered it a bit. <laughs> Those I'm recommending for daily, and then the top things are optional, right? Because we know we can be healthy vegans, but we also know that, you know, not everybody chooses that path exactly. Water, again, so important. How do we check to see if we've drank enough water? Simple check. You can do it anywhere in the world. Catch a little bit of urine <laughs> and look at the color. If you have, if you're well hydrated, your urine is going to be very clear or just a very light yellow. If it's dark, you're in trouble. You know, they say that um, the urologist would go out of business if people drank enough water. And I think that's probably true. It's so simple, and yet we know, Jesus tells us all over the Bible, even in Revelations, we're going to be drinking from that fountain of living water. Again, on the color, the eating things that are pleasing to the eye, why does the rainbow work? Just one example, vitamin A comes in foods that are orange, fleshy in nature. Not the oranges themselves, those are the vitamin C champions. But the vitamin A comes in the carrots and the mangoes and the pumpkins and squash. And all of that is so essential for a, your immune system, for your eyesight, and for your skin. So eating, just making sure you're getting something orange, that's a very simple thing. It's very low cost, too. We don't have to be gourmet vegans with you know, fancy recipe cookbooks to just say, you know what, make sure your kids are eating carrots, especially in the winter during the sick flu season. Get them carrots every day. This is how I do it. <laughs> I peel them and put them in a container of uh, salt water. And the salt, it keeps it from getting sort of a wiggly <laughs> or soggy kind of carrot. Keeps them very, very crisp. I actually get compliments on my carrots when I bring them to potluck. And, and it's just so simple and so cheap. We need to make our health message accessible to the poor. Also, the greens we talked about yesterday, really, really exposing people to um, greens and the nitrates in them. In Africa, we're actually foraging for wild edible greens. And there's tons of them that are edible and people get excited about it because their grandmas or their ancestors ate them and they've just neglected them in recent years. So I want to share with you another quick video about adding color to the diet and how much fun it can be. This is from Zimbabwe. And you'll see Betty in it again. Um, <laughs> you like it? Delicious. <laughs> <laughs> That's tough. Is that what the blackjack did? Have you eaten blackjack before? Some, sorry? Eaten the blackjack, the greens? These are wild greens, right? Mm -hmm. Do you like them? Yes, I do like them. Yeah. Do you eat them normally or is this something new? It's, it's new. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That is How many of the foods on your plate are new to you? Um, this is the egg. That's a mm. soy egg. The <laughs> red cabbage. That's it's new. new. Wow. Yes. The mixer of this vegetable is also new to me. Wow. Yeah. Now, do you usually eat white sadza or that color sadza? I used to eat white sadza. Oh. Mm. And now, after this class? I'm going to eat this brown sadza. Why? Do you know why? I heard that it's so nutritious. It is. Yeah. Yes, yeah. you listened well. Yeah. Praise so, be to God. Yeah. What do you think, Betty? Did you teach well? <laughs> What do you think? She learned a good lesson today, huh? She really learned because she was so good in doing here the rainbow, doing the greens, the sanitation. In the garden, she was so very, very nice. In fact, the, all the women of Mandindindi, they were so participative and they were happy. That's and wonderful. My, my, I'm praying that what they've learned, let them practice it in their homes. Exactly. We come back to Mandindindi when everybody has a vegetable garden. So, I think they will. They all got seedlings. And Betty, you came all the way from where to teach farms to? Yeah, um, I come from farms to Uganda. I'm the vice president in Uganda. Uganda. So I came from Uganda to come to Zimbabwe. I'm in Igweru in the village of Mandindindi. <laughs> I'm to, to teach farm stew. 
so that we can learn from each other. Exactly, and we've been here all day. We had a very big, exciting class. And we cooked right here, this whole big feast was cooked right here. Right out with the chickens and the wonderful dish drying rack, right? So, so that's one of our classes live and, um, oops, cancel, sorry. And uh, so I forgot to mention that was at the Mutema's house. That was at the end of the day and I, I didn't get that picture when there was a big crowd, but we had so much fun. Most of the 30 plus people that were there were not Adventist and we just had a, a great time and I think that's something that could be replicated really anywhere. Teaching, gardening, eating the food right out of the garden. So we all need to choose man's way or God's way. This little girl is eating tomato balls, if you can see. <laughs> um, and, and her hands were just covered with the, the red food dyes that were covering those little basically like Cheeto type things. We're all in this position at this point of Daniel and his friends. Never before in human history have we all had this, this potential of the king's table. Whenever we go even into a gas station or any store, there's so many options of foods. And you notice how much money are they spending on colors? The food companies know that we're told and designed by God to eat foods that are pleasing to the eye. And that's Satan's deception. All those food colors and all that addition, all this packaging, they're spending money on all this stuff just to trick us. So we want to go for the natural colors, the rainbow of fruits and vegetables. And if we do, if we teach anything else about our health message, if all we teach is the rainbow, we're going to improve people's health dramatically. Dramatically. Also, just talking about small grains, it's such an important thing. I don't have time to go into it a lot, but the native indigenous grains like millet, sorghum, and amaranth, they're very, very powerful nutritionally. And like I said, beans as well, very powerful. Uh, the, the National Geographic found that they were eating four times the amount of what we're eating, and that one serving of beans per day could add four extra years to our life. Now, beans come in a big category, legumes. Uh, so we have the soybeans, the peanuts, the pulses, which are the dried beans and peas, chickpeas, lentils, fresh peas and beans. So actually, the United Nations declared 2017 the year of the pulse. It was like an international big movement trying to get people to grow and eat more pulses. One of the reasons they want them to grow them is because these are all leguminous crops. They all fix nitrogen out of the air and put it into the soil. That's basically like free fertilizer. And when you have all these depleted soils that can't grow anything but cassava, that growing some of these pulses can actually transform the soil quality just in a year. So I find it no surprise that beans also come in a rainbow. Isn't God loving? <laughs> These are all those types of beans and, and, you know, just that variety. God wants us to have variety in color. I love that our church is the most ethnically and racially diverse denomination in the world. Aren't we happy about that? It's a beautiful thing when you show up and, and there's such a mix of people. So again, God is reflected in the seed. And I want you to remember that he says, or Paul says about this, for the sense the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. We know the word Trinity is not in the Bible, but Godhead is the next best thing to Trinity. That Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that is an important principle to our Christian faith, and it's reflected in every seed. So how can we help our neighbors be able to have that rainbow? I want to tell you about a very powerful resource that we have. And actually, Paul, who leads this ministry, is called Born to Grow. It's totally a, um, you can't tell he's an Adventist. You can't even tell he's a Christian from his website. But it's a uh, website that is like a club for learning to garden. He and his wife are actually over teaching the children right now here at ASI. And they are a powerful couple. His last name is Dysinger. And the Dysingers are known in, in the Adventist world as being amazing farmers. I'm pleased because his father, Edwin, is actually on our board of directors. 
But I've joined this club, joined their webinars. It's really a wonderful community, and it would be another form of friendship evangelism on their web Facebook page and whatnot. So one of the things about using scripture in the work too, just talking about when we submit to the Lord, he will make our paths straight. Straight paths are so important. We can use the Bible verse about Jesus and, you know, sowing the seeds and the seed that fall on the path and the birds snatch it up. So we have to distinguish between where we're cultivating and where we're walking. Simple things like that can increase the productivity of a garden dramatically. We talk about rest, compost as a form of rest. Compost, this is made in Zimbabwe, it can retain 10 times the moisture of regular soil. So you can imagine in a drought-stricken area, having something that you can produce yourself that can contain 10 times the moisture is a powerful, powerful thing. With our rest message, I just want to share with you, there's a, um, a brand new National Geographic that came out and it's all about sleep. If we're not talking about our health message, guys, somebody else is going to do it. But they're not going to do it using the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy as their tool. On the outside of this magazine, it says, we are now living in a worldwide test of the negative consequences of sleep deprivation. It is scary. These are the, the, the thing about kids are struggling, not getting enough sleep. Teachers are suffering from sleep deprived children. And the interesting thing is they're, they, we have all this new science telling us, you know, it's the immune system, it's all these different um, growth, infection fighting proteins are released during sleep. But Ellen White knew this a long time ago, didn't she? She says, in regulating the hours for sleep, there should be no haphazard work. Go to rest at a reasonable hour. How many of us are guilty of that sometimes? <laughs> Okay, I am, I know I am, and I'm working on it. Eight, seven to eight hours of rest is best. Too much and too little can be detrimental. And I don't know if we're connecting it as much, but the loss of sleep, I'm sorry, the loss of sleep contributing to a loss of immunity is a very serious thing. Another thing that actually might motivate people more is that obesity rates are higher in sleep-deprived people. <laughs> You probably, it probably makes sense. They're just probably more lethargic during the day. Here's a scary fact. Only 5% of Americans wash their hands properly. <laughs> These researchers, they hired like 1,000 people to go out into bathrooms and just do silly things at the mirror so that they, they could observe people's behavior. Only 5% washing their hands properly with soap for 15 seconds. So, like I showed before, we have these tippy taps. We're so excited about these. Um, but, you know, we have sinks here. It's very easy to teach basic hand washing. And that hasn't been part of our health message thus far. It's the habit of hand washing could save more lives than any single vaccine or medical intervention. So, one of the things that's important about thinking about a context that's maybe different than our own, you can't just say, wash your hands because you're going to get microbes. If people have not really been able to use a microscope and maybe they just read about it in a textbook once long ago, we need to think differently about how to motivate hand washing. So instead of making it about the individual, we make it about the community. So the verse, each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. It makes people realize that when they're touching somebody's food, when they're shaking somebody's hand, you have the potential of making somebody else sick. In cultures that are more communal, that type of thinking is really important. So as you're reaching maybe refugees here, that you want to alter your type of thinking. It's not all about me, 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 trying to be healthy and live long. It's about others and what can we give to others. Another thing, um, this was one of my professors at John Hopkins, and he was kind of a radical professor, and he said, people need jobs. Employment is the very best public health intervention. So when we're helping people, we want to be making sure that it's not about me and what I'm doing for you, but ultimately it's about you and what you're doing for yourself to make your life better. Again, for those of us that get involved, though, there are benefits. Jesus says it's better to give than to receive, and now that's been proven by science. Older adults who volunteered reap the benefits of health and well-being, and a large study found a 44% reduction in early death among those who volunteered a lot 
Now, I'm not against exercise, but they got the same effect as if they had exercised four times a week. So that's something to think about. Encouraging in our church volunteerism, encouraging in our community volunteerism, and thinking up ways to have meaningful engagement, just that connection with each other, there's a lot of health benefits of it. In Acts, it records Jesus' thoughts on the matter. He says, I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than receive. So one of our things that we're very proud of as Adventists is that we have this abundant life. But one of my questions that I just want to throw out to you all is how does abundant life relate to income? It's not only us as Adventists that are living longer than the rest of the American populations. This graph looks at um, the, the income quartile. So the top quarter of people in this country in terms of their income are living a full 15 years more than the bottom quartile. So health and income, longevity and income are highly, highly correlated. So we need to really think about that because Jesus, Jesus' ministry was not just to the rich, right? He had a particular passion and commitment to the poor. We also know that childhood poverty, that slide looks a little bit different than it did. It is increasing. That slide's not showing it well. But um, childhood poverty is increasing dramatically. This is on the global scale. If we look at life expectancy on the vertical axis and income on the horizontal, you see we start here at $1,000 a year going up all the way, exponentially growing up to $128,000 a year. The blue dots are Africa. So you can see this highly correlated effect between income and longevity with the continent of Africa at the very, very bottom of both, both the income and the longevity. So here we are, we're seeing explosive growth in our church in Africa, and yet the life expectancy is 60 years or less in most countries. And we have to wonder, you know, Adventists, we'd be way off the chart. There's the good old US of A, the green up there at the very height. So if we're spending all of our energy of our health message trying to bump ourselves up a, a little line or two, I just don't think that's where God would want us to put all of our energy. We know that people are not just dropping dead in Africa, right, when they turn 60 years old. The life expectancy is highly impacted by childhood mortality. And if we look at this, we see in the pink and the blue and the light blue, those are areas, the pink is 40% of the children are severely malnourished. Dark blue, 30 to 40%. So we see, again, the continent of Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia hovering around a third of the people that are severely malnourished. So women and children, this is in a, a hospital, they are dying. Um, we trained there about a year ago, and within two days, two of the kids that we had trained had died. So how can we make a difference for them? This is a concept, the first 1,000 days of life, and this book I really highly recommend. It's looking at the time period from conception till the child is two years old. Those are the most critical time periods for nutrition. So all of our work, really, they, we should have a particular focus on that first 1,000 days of life if we're trying to do health education and nutrition. And the thing I love about this book is it actually takes a mom from Uganda, from Guatemala, from India, and from Chicago, <laughs> two hours from my house. And it compares their struggle and their journey to be able to provide their children with the healthful foods that they need. And frankly, we're all being confronted by the same industrialized food system that is all about making money off of sick people. It's really, really an enemy that we're up against. So we want to have abundant life for the poor and children like Sarah. So why should we care about the poor, though, when our churches themselves are struggling for life? Do we really have time for this? Is this really an Adventist ministry? Well, there's a couple of books that focus a lot on the poor, one of them being the Bible itself. And a second one, if you're not familiar with Ellen White's welfare ministry, I would highly recommend it. You can listen to it on your app, on your smartphone. I do that on a regular basis because I'm so amazed by the words she has to say. 
We know Jesus started out his mission saying, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He had a particular focus on the poor. And the Bible is full of all sorts of evidence that caring for the poor is so important. But how is that going to help our churches? How is that going to bring life into our churches? I want you to watch a quick video because Ellen White says we should always look to nature to learn what we have to learn. And I believe this is a great example of abundant life. So it says, so give, live, and love. <laughs> I love that. If we think about the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee, we know that one is just constantly giving out. It's exciting. One of the things we're hoping to do is to make our curriculum available to other ministries, and that's something we're working really diligently and hope by the end of this year we can have that prepared. Yes? Yes, fortunately, Zimbabwe and Uganda both are all non-GMO countries, so it's pretty wonderful in that regard. And we also try to use non-hybrids so that people can save the seeds and have the same quality. Yeah, so like the heirloom type seeds. But we do, we do partner with the university in Uganda to get a really excellent variety of soy, um, and, and there, there's a lot of good reasons for that. Somebody asked me, how do you send money to Africa and make sure it it works, it's being done to the right thing. Those remittances, you know, they are shown to be the most powerful development tool, actually more effective than foreign aid. But what I would say is, is that we actually, as part of a family of faith, if we run this ministry as a family of faith of people that love each other, like I love Betty, like I love Edward, like I love, you know, I always tell them, if we don't have trust in this relationship, I'm done. I can't walk around and fundraise for people that I don't trust. But I also have really strong accountability systems of record keeping and, and having people go over and review the documents. And then I hope in the future, uh, very soon, to be able to have even um, calling back the local community leaders. We have them all in a database and be evaluating them. So we do need to have the trust. We also need to have the checks and accountability and make sure things are run properly. And uh, so that's a really important thing to keep our family of faith working as a healthy, functioning family. So thank you all for coming. God bless you all. And please do visit us. And uh, yes, and just all, visit all the booths. We are so blessed in this church. There's nothing like it in any denomination I've ever seen. And it's just tremendous to be part of this ASI ministry. So thank you. <laughs>